The White Bear Area Chamber of Commerce and SCC TV are proud to present Your Business Matters, dedicated to your business needs. The White Bear Area Chamber is a nonprofit business organization serving as advocates to the White Bear Area and its business community. Now, here's the Executive Director of the White Bear Area Chamber and the host of Your Business Matters, Tom Snell. Welcome to Your Business Matters, brought to you by the White Bear Area Chamber of Commerce. Each month, we interview community leaders and local business owners so you can be informed about the developments in our community. I'm pleased to welcome John Epids, the Executive Director of the Minnesota Regional Railroad Association, and Peter Gilbertson from Anacostia Pacific. We will discuss why commercial rail needs to play a vital role in Minnesota's transportation system. Thank you both for uh, joining me today. Good to be here. The first uh, question I have is I would like both of you to tell me a little bit about what your organization and what your business actually uh, does. Maybe start with the uh, Minnesota Regional Railroads Association, yes. which is the uh, trade association for railroads here in Minnesota. There are 20 railroads that operate in Minnesota. Not just one. Not, not just, just one. Uh, 20 of them. Yes. And uh, four of them are what we call large class one railroads. The other 16 are smaller short line railroads like the one you have right here yes. in the Minnesota commercial. And uh, in Minnesota, we run on about 4,500 miles of track. Most of that's taken up by the uh, large railroads. Burlington Northern, Canadian Pacific, CP, mm -hmm. Canadian or Canadian National, and the uh, and the Union Pacific, but the other railroads take up about five or six hundred miles mm -hmm. of track, and they're really the capillaries that lead into the railroad system sure. across the state. Our age, our association represents the uh, railroads at the Minnesota Capitol. We'll talk a little bit about that when we get further yeah, down the line. As we go on, we Absolutely. certainly will. Uh, Peter? Our company owns one of those 20 railroads uh, mm -hmm. in Minnesota. It's based in St. Cloud. It's called Northern Lines Railway. And uh, again, a feeder line to BNSF, mm -hmm. which goes through St. Cloud. Uh, we also have five other railroads in other states that, that we operate. And uh, as John said, the short lines are really the, the feeder lines or the first and last mile yes. for a lot of the big railroads. Mm -hmm. Well, that kind of leads into my next question. If you could just uh, elaborate a little bit on why, uh, why are these uh, short line rails, railroads, so we just don't have these couple of large railroads that own everything. You mentioned that there are a number of smaller short line railroad entrepreneurs that own these other uh, venues. Why is that so vital and important to the state of Minnesota? Can I give you a little history first so we have a context for why there's big railroads and little railroads? Kind of yeah. the mom and pop operations, the retail operations, and the wholesale operations. Yes. You know, railroading built America. Honest to gosh, it really did. Railroads have been around for about 160 years in the United States. And up through a couple of world wars, railroads were a very, very important part of moving anything in the United States of America. We used to have twice as much track in Minnesota as we have today. And, uh, and we had... Um, eight times the number of large railroads that we have today. After the Second World War, government was regulating the railroads very severely and basically drove them into bankruptcy. In 1980, something called the Staggers Act was passed, which allowed the railroads to be deregulated, and the system was rationalized. What mm -hmm. you got essentially was seven large railroads and about 550 smaller railroads, which were spin-offs from the large railroads that were, uh, that some of the, which were uh, consolidated, mm -hmm. merged, et cetera. Many of Peter's lines are, are of those. And in fact, the Minnesota Commercial, which operates through White Bear Lake, used to be uh, a main line to Duluth, to the right. Northern Pacific. And there, was a, there were several parallel routes, essentially, from St. Paul to Duluth. There was mm -hmm. the Great Northern, the Northern Pacific, the Sioux Line, mm -hmm. uh, the Chicago Northwestern, all were in that corridor. And when the Burlington Northern merger occurred, the Great Northern and the Northern Pacific merged, and they selected the Great mm -hmm. Northern route as their primary route. So the Northern Pacific route through, through uh, White Bear Lake mm -hmm. was surplus. And portions of it were abandoned north of Hugo, for example. Right. But the, the remnant here had a cluster of customers that made for a, 
a viable small railroad that, that continues to feed the large system. Yeah. So it's really that history that That's John's right. referring mm -hmm. to. Um, and what, what made the, the entrepreneurs like myself possible w was the partial deregulation of the railroads that made it easier to acquire these lines. Right. And I know, I know that uh, you know historically that's that's a very important fact. Uh, how about some of the communities that uh, that some of these railroads serve, and what would be like the economic development ramifications if some of these uh, commercial rail lines had to shut down? Are there? Let me give you an example. Are there any smaller towns maybe in Minnesota that are served by some of these smaller? commercial rail lines that are real lifeblood to those communities. And, and what would happen, I mean, I, I'm looking for like a value proposition sure. as to what, how these railroads are important, particularly maybe to some of the outlying uh, areas in the state. Cold Spring, for instance, on Northern Lines Rail. Right. We, we, our line that's based in St. Cloud is, again, mm -hmm. some remnants of Great Northern, Northern Pacific lines that yep. were merged into that. We have only six employees on that railroad, but our customers employ almost a thousand people. Oh, okay. So you, you get a, a sense of, of the economic significance yes. of it. And we have clients up there that uh, 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 Martin Marietta Quarry, for example, which is a you know granite mm -hmm. quarry there, big, huge operation there. They're, they're uh, access to the outside world, if you will, mm -hmm. is via our small railroad. So we're preserving those jobs. We're, we're growing jobs in some cases by attracting new mm -hmm. business to these locations. That's great. Let me offer you another example, and that is uh, along the Twin Cities and Western Rail Railroad yeah. that runs basically uh, uh, from, east, uh, from west to east in, in southern Minnesota. You know about the ethanol industry, the yes. ethanol industry that's come out of our agricultural products and grown exponentially. The only way that could grow was on a railroad. You can't move ethanol in anything but a, uh, but a tank car. Mm. It does not move in a pipeline. So the entire ethanol industry that is, is mm -hmm. billions of dollars of value in Minnesota, yes. many, many jobs, would not exist were it not for the TC&W yeah. and, and a few others that move that. And so that really leads me into my next question is... Looking at our policymakers, our legislature in the state of Minnesota, how have they reacted to the need to enhance our commercial rail operations, the small, you know, again, the small businesses that run these operations? And when you look at it in a more comprehensive way and you look at the other states that are around Minnesota, how do we compare with Wisconsin and Iowa and uh, the kind of the five Midwestern states uh, that make up our region. So it's kind of a double-edged question, but it's if a very you could good respond question. to that, I'd appreciate it's a, it. It's a very good question, and it has uh, substance right here, in, right here in White Bear Township, in, in this area. Um, as you compare us to other states, we have not been given quite the sympathy or the uh, large that other states have given to their mm -hmm. small railroad industry. Uh, we've got a program in Minnesota called the, the Minnesota Rail Service Improvement Program. The acronym for that is MERCY. Yes. We have a MERCY program um, that has been a loan program, a low-interest loan program for railroads for, for many, many years. Unfortunately, low-interest loans aren't terribly helpful, especially mm -hmm. in this economy and this environment. A couple of years ago, the Department of Transportation helped us change that loan program to a grant program yeah. so that there can be uh, money set, uh, filtered, provided to some of the smaller sure. operators in the state of Minnesota. Um, we got a million dollars a couple of years ago for that program. The governor has recommended $5 million in this particular uh, biennium. Uh, there has been a request from the House author of a bill for $10 million. To your point about comparing it to other states, Wisconsin does tens of millions of dollars. Right. I, I was just going to say that, according to my uh, information, <clears throat> Uh, Wisconsin has spent a lot more money on their commercial rail needs in Minnesota. Iowa as well. Iowa, Iowa as well. also, mm -hmm. yes. Mm -hmm. Let me though just give some credit as well to, to a couple of the legislators right here. Senator, uh, uh, Senator Chamberlain and yes, from House Member our Rundle. area. Mm -hmm. Both carried legislation to help the Minnesota commercial and were intimate yes. in getting that piece of, getting those, that appropriation put into the bonding bill. So. There's a very real understanding right here in White Bear Lake yep. that didn't exist, doesn't exist in a lot of other places. 
There are a couple of other folks out in the western part, in the rural parts of the state, a fellow by the name of Paul Torkelson, who's a state representative, used to be the uh, chairman yeah. of the House Committee. Uh, Gary Dames are yeah. all out in that neck of the woods, and they're working very hard to get some additional funding into this program. So is it, is it uh, correct to say that uh, if you look at Minnesota, and we did, we, you, you brought up the state of Wisconsin, but if you look at Minnesota and you look at our other states like Iowa, for example, are we really kind of the outlier uh, as far as our support then, if you look at more comprehensive on a, a regional basis? Our organization did, and uh, the, Com the Minnesota Commercial helped do a survey of what short lines in Minnesota yeah. really need. The number we came up with was about $90 million yes. to fix up uh, many of these short lines to fix a bridge. A bridge will cost you a million dollars, easily. Uh, and $90 million is roughly the figure we're looking at. $5 million touches on that, but if we were in Iowa, yeah. we'd take care of a lot of that in a few short years. Mm -hmm. And, and what are the public policy arguments for yeah. in making that investment? I mean, yes. there's, there's several. One is we talked about is job retention and growth mm -hmm. in, in an economic development. The other is uh, uh, one, one rail car generally carries the equivalent of three trucks. Yes. So the, it, it, by having these viable railroads, you keep trucks off the road and, and the impacts that those trucks have in communities. Mm -hmm. The third element is the uh, environmental benefits of rail. We can move a ton of freight um, on one gallon about 490 miles. It's about wow. four, four to five times more efficient than truck from an uh, emissions and, and efficiency standpoint. So very significant uh, moving forward. And, I, and that was going to be exactly lead into my uh, next question is looking at uh, because of the uh, real focus now on uh, environmental issues. Um, how well does rail uh, relate to maybe keeping trucks off the road, which can uh, potentially save money because of the wear and tear on our, our, our freeways and our road systems? And uh, also, uh, you mentioned how it doesn't use a lot of uh, fossil fuel. Right. Uh, so are there issues related to our environmental issues that directly relate back to the need for uh, support for commercial rail? Let me just reiterate what Peter said. You've got about a three to one, four to one difference in terms of what a railroad car can carry versus what a number of trucks carry. Yes. And you've got about a four or five to one uh, ratio in terms of the amount of fuel it takes to move that. Railroads are also looking at different ways of propelling uh, their, their operations. Uh, we're talking about liquid, uh, natural, liquid uh, natural gas. We're talking about some sort of electronic railroads in mm -hmm. certain instances like that. A lot of research going on in those areas, which are going to benefit the economy as well. Also, uh, Peter uh, can reference a study that's been done by a, the National Science Foundation, which looks at this question of how efficient railroads are and the, the value of using yep. what we do. Move yeah, stuff? Th there have been a number of studies. That's one. There's there was a recent study by the EU that says use of rail for freight and passenger is part of the climate change solution worldwide. Uh huh. And we also have a, a mode of transportation here where you can use and in, in Europe railroads are electrified in, in on many of the routes, mm -hmm. and you can use the grid to power that. So if you have a grid that's powered by yep. Renewables, you can you can do that. We are uh, experimenting right now on one of our other railroads with battery-powered locomotives that are rechargeable mm -hmm. in a recharging station like a Plug car, in. automobile, plug-ins, essentially. Yes. And so we have that future, and, and there are real benefits from that. Excellent. Now, if you look at, again, Minnesota mm -hmm. and the a comprehensive uh, com commercial rail lines that we have, want to look at what we need to do to make improvements. You mentioned $90 million. So if you were to look at, at how these uh, railroads are uh, operating, are, they, are any of them in critical condition? And are any of them in really need of repair? Uh, how, do you, how do you look at that? And what is the situation in our state in the need to move forward and uh, make sure that these rail lines are going to be around for the next uh, several decades. 
You make a very good, that's a very good question, Tom. Let me say one thing first. Sure. Railroads operate safely. We are governed by the Federal Railroad Administration. Yep. That is our safety regulator. And there's not a railroad in the state of Minnesota that doesn't operate in a safe fashion. Is there older equipment? Can you do upgrades? Certainly, yep. that can be done. But every piece of track, every mile of rail uh, is inspected and made sure that it, that it operates, yep. that, that, that we're operating safely. You just have to do that because mm -hmm. of the nature of the industry. Um, let me say there are situations where you have bridges, where you have, uh, well, running a railroad requires that you replace this, this uh, infrastructure regulated, regulated to keep it up to speed. It takes 3,000 ties to cover a mile of railroad track. Those ties need to be replaced every 20 to 30 years, depending on what sort of ties they are. Uh -huh. And so on even 500 miles of track, you can imagine the number of ties, the number of spikes, et cetera, that are needed to be replaced, uh -huh. and which are a very, very expensive cost. Let me, let me just say this. The rail industry puts about 15 to 20 percent of its annual spend into improving its infrastructure. That's particularly with the class ones, with the, lar with the larger railroads. But that's more than any other industry does. If you're in a general retail industry, that figure is about well, three percent, mm -hmm. as opposed to the 15 to 20 percent that it takes to rehabilitate okay. this. In Minnesota. The large railroads have spent about $25 billion over the last five years to improve the infrastructure that they're running on, make it smoother, faster, better, et cetera, mm -hmm. and keep it up to speed. The smaller railroads have invested millions of dollars, but nowhere near that, and they need to do improvements as well, for, for if only so that they can haul the larger size sure. loads that are being required when we put them on the larger railroads. So I guess, you know, and that's, a, that's great. Um, why do we uh, why do we need uh, uh, an investment of about ninety million dollars then in order to make sure that our our rail lines are going to be safe and secure? Well, again, if you go back to the history here, uh -huh. you look at why these lines are now being operated by small railroads. Yep. Is yep. they tended to be light density lines that that the large railroads didn't want for whatever reason. Oh, okay. So. So the, the large railroads logically didn't invest in these properties. Um, sure. So uh, we inherited, in many cases, lines that had deferred maintenance or... They would have been closed, these yeah. lines? Yes. They were abandoned. In yeah. A, a lot of these lines would have been abandoned and have been saved by these entrepreneurs. Can I, uh, can I uh, interject? Uh, would that maybe have included the line that goes up to Hugo? Oh, that absolutely. Serves like Easily. 500 employees and yes. uh, four major business operations? Well, again, if you look at the statistics, you mm -hmm. we've gone, what's the mileage reduction that we've... About we've half. Had, about it would half have been abandoned. gone, gone right. away, mm -hmm. yeah. And you're really, rebuilding it once it's gone is almost impossible. Yeah. So these, these, these short lines are preserving these yep. lines for the future. But again, when they, when they started operations, many of them had deferred uh -huh. maintenance. And so we're catching up Yep. Uh, in this maintenance effort. And again, if you look at the math of this, uh, and this is in a recent article about the Minnesota commercial, yeah. about yep. 10 carloads a week on that line. Yeah. And the revenue round numbers is $400 a car. And so you can do the math. Yeah. You can't spend a million dollars to upgrade the line. Now, if, uh, if Burling, if the rail, the major rail lines in the state, if they actually, some of the uh, these short line rail are still owned, the tracks are still owned by the major rail companies. Is that correct? That's correct. Mm -hmm. How does a smaller entrepreneur then uh, get a loan from a bank if the rail line is owned by somebody else? That is an important point because right. you the you want to give the bank a mortgage. You're mortgaging somebody else's property, which yeah. has all sorts of complications. So that is a that is a difficulty. Loans are are inherently difficult for that reason. Yeah. So can, can I just say one thing too that I think it's important to say? These are a lot of people are confused that somehow there's a national railroad system. There yes. is a national railroad system, but it's a privately owned system. So yeah. people like Peter who own a railroad have to go to the bank just like you and I take out a yeah. loan to run yes. that business. It is not a government operated uh, industry by any stretch of the imagination. No, that's uh, an important point. Yeah. People yeah. do not realize that, that we have a 
virtually a, a completely private network in the United States. Mm -hmm. There's a few exceptions. Amtrak owns the Northeast Corridor yeah. uh, in you know, New York to Boston and Washington. But with that exception, virtually all these lines are privately yeah. operated. And uh, every year, the, uh, I mean, uh, there are billions of dollars of private yep. investment yep. put into these lines. So this isn't going to the taxpayer and saying, pay our bills. It's just on the increment mm -hmm. for some deferred maintenance areas, yeah. really. So if you were going to um, go again to the legislature, which I'm sure you will during okay. the session here, and you're going to sell the need for commercial rail to be part of our overall transportation system. Uh, how do you appeal to some of the legislators to make sure that they clearly understand how important this is? The best thing, the best thing we can do is go into the communities like, like this, Tom, and have these conversations with local residents, with local businesses who understand that their survival, their existence, depends on having a mode of transportation uh -huh. that is economical, that is uh, environmentally friendly, and that is timely and, and there when they need it. And have those residents talk to their local legislators. That's what happened here uh -huh. with, uh, with your local legislators. It was right. the business people in this town, I think yourself is one yes. of those, went to those legislators and said, without this railroad, we're not going to have the sort of cost-effective transportation that we need to move our lumber products, to move our oil, to move our ethanol, to move our grain, whatever it might be. That's the best way to do it. Those are the best allies when I go up to lobby on behalf of the association that mm -hmm. I have. It's the mayor of Winthrop, it's the mayor of Mankato, it's the, it's the mayor of White Bear Lake, as yes. a matter of fact, who yeah. comes in and argues the case. Um, mm -hmm. They're real people, and to legislators, they're real votes, and they mean a lot when they speak. Yeah. And will that, if that number is five million, will that five million Avoid another five million that we need yeah. to spend on the highway system. Probably several multiples of that. So there's a real. It isn't that this money is just you know going out the the door. There is a benefit to those customers, to job retention, environment, and everything else. But mm -hmm. there's also just a, a fiscal benefit to the state, yep. which otherwise would have to spend that money yeah. elsewhere. So that that's a really uh, interesting point. Now, when you're targeting uh, different areas, are there uh, you, you have an a operation in uh, St. Cloud, and you said one in, in Mankato. Uh, are, are these uh, communities then going to be engaged in the discussion that's going to happen on the need to uh, have this commercial rail? I think the best instance, yes, is the answer to your question. The best instance of, instance of that is uh, the little town of Winthrop. The little town yeah. of Winthrop has uh, a railroad that ran through it called the um, uh, the Red uh, excuse the Minnesota Valley Regional Railroad. Today, yep. it's known as the Minnesota Prairie Line. Yep. That town had nothing. The uh, the tracks ran through town, yeah. and the boxcars fell off the tracks when they were standing still. It was mm -hmm. in such bad condition. The legislature put in about ten million dollars. The federal government did about the same sort of thing. That town today is thriving. They have rail transportation. They have five new major businesses, yeah. food, fertilizer, sand, and they've got people from all around the area working. The mayor of Winthrop, as you can imagine, is one of the best advocates we have mm -hmm. for uh, our particular okay. industry. Now, if somebody wants to get a hold of you folks, how would they, how would they contact you? Why don't you uh, give me your... The easiest way to get in touch with the Railroad Association is go to our website, which is mnrailroads.com. Okay. mnrailroads.com. Okay, that's easy. There's a link to me right there. You can call me up anytime you want. Um, happy to visit about this subject, as, as you can see. But and that, Railroads. that website will also give you contact Great. information for all the okay. individual railroads. Okay. Mm -hmm. well. Thank you, John and Peter, for uh, joining me today on uh, Your Business Matters. I don't know if we should shake hands. Thank you, Tom. Okay, we'll okay. do that. There we go. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. You've been watching Your Business Matters. For more information on this program or the White Bear Area Chamber, visit whitebearchamber.com or call 651-429-8593.